We're coming to you live from our studios here in Kukumlimle, Accra, streaming live on DSTV channel 421, Go TV channel 144, on your digital television and around the world at myjoyonline.com. The details now. Three persons have sustained severe injuries following a fire outbreak at the Secondi Fishing Bay in the Western region. Several fishing gears have also been burnt into ashes in the fire which occurred on Thursday night. The cause of the fire is not known, but it's suspected to have been triggered by exposed flames during the discharge of premix fuel. We'll go live to the area shortly. Uh, but before then, correspondent in Athalia Kwansa has been speaking to victims of the fire. Yeah, So you had some victims of that incident there. Let's now speak to uh, our correspondent in the area, Ina Thalia Kwansa. Hello, Ina. Uh, briefly explain to us what these victims have been telling you. <laughs> Hello, Ina, can you hear me? Well, it appears that uh, we are having some difficulty there with Ina hearing us. Uh, she's currently at the scene. Uh, she visited the place again this morning. Earlier, you heard uh, persons who were affected by the incident talking to her, uh, explaining their losses. The last woman you heard uh, was basically asking government to come to her aid, uh, saying that she's, she's lost a lot uh, in that fire incident. Uh, while we wait for Inna to join us, we will be telling you a similar in, about a similar incident which occurred exactly a week before this one. But that one was in Cape Coast and it also involved premix fuel and uh, uh, some persons were, were said to have been injured. But I understand we have Inna back. Uh, hello, Inna. 
I was asking you to briefly explain to us what the victims were saying in the videos you sent. 4 p.m. we had a distress call that there is a raging fire here. We came here and see there was a raging fire. There were six fire attendants from the fire service. And then from within three hours, they were able to put the thing under control. This morning, we've come here to see what has happened. I can count about 15 shops which have been burned to ashes. In this shop, they have outboard motors. They have um, net, fishing nets, among others. I understand that um, people were hoarding fuel here. And so some of these shops contain fuel. It has been a mis uh, it has been a banter between fisher for fishermen and then the women here. Whilst the fishermen are blaming the women who cook around here, the women are also blaming the fisher folks who keep fuel in here. But I have with me here Mary, who was here and saw what happened. So I'll go to her and ask the Officials telling you, uh, we've heard from those who are on the ground, but what is the MC, what is NATMO? Uh, I believe they have leadership at the fishing bay. What are, what are they all saying? Uh, it appears we missed Ina there. Uh, hopefully, she would be able to uh, give us those details. But what you're seeing now uh, are visuals of uh, devastation caused by fire at the second D uh, fishing bay. All right, Ina, if you can hear me, I was asking you what authorities are saying about the incident. Hello, Ina, can you hear me? Hello, Ina, if you can hear me, I'm asking you what authorities are saying about this municipal... Uh, okay, even... Bene, so um, this morning I met the city mayor, Mr. Moomin, and then I met um, Andrew Sejapamesa, who is the MP for this constituency. He says that um, with the issue of pardon, he has also said that he has had it, and so um, they are going to work on it, because that is this place is close to the Western Naval Command, and where we have installations. So if the thing was, if the fire service had not come in earlier, the issue would have been another thing all around. 
They have not promised that they are going to give them any money or they are going to um, help them with what they've lost. They've lost. But I've seen that more officials get taking details of what the people have lost yesterday. In Athalia Kwanso there, joining us from uh, 2nd D, giving us updates on that incident which occurred on Thursday. But now let me, let me bring you an update on a similar situation that occurred in Cape Coast. And uh, we've been hearing from uh, the NATMO official. Now, dozens of fishermen were injured in that particular outbreak. And that fire is suspected to have been triggered uh, by the use of some electrical gutters during the discharge of premix fuel again. Uh, we'll get some updates from our correspondent Richard Kojunyako, but first listen to uh, the Nanmo boss in the area. <laughs> Some of them had uh, this thing, second degree burning, and they are in the hospital. We, make, uh, we send a uh, report to Accra headquarters of NADMO, and we're able to secure some few items for them to support the family of those, those victims. So we had rice, blanket, cooking oil, soap, mosquito net, mattresses, and all those things that they, at least they can start something with it. So this, this is what we brought to them this afternoon to, to, uh, to share for them so they will start making use of, of it. So the time, regional minister and uh, the MC will bring in their lost uh, working tools like the uh, uh, fishing net and uh, ahead machines. My brother, the way uh, how the, uh, this thing happened to us, we are just advising those people that this time around, nobody should go and buy the premix and go and hide it or for, uh, for safekeeping because it is a fuel which has a, a they say, they, uh, who doesn't even want heat. So they should make sure that whenever they are going to see or when they are going to fish in, if they need two gallons, they just go and buy, then they go. The next time when they want to go again, they, they, they go, but they should stop hoarding it because it is dangerous to their life. It has happened so many places at Sopon, uh, this thing, Second and even Cape Coast here. So at this the time, they're supposed to advise themselves. I think the premier's committee people too, we need to talk to them and they will have a committee that will uh, overlook things, uh, I mean, look over the uh, thing because so, uh, what the report we had is that even the premise uh, uh, committee themselves, they do buy this premise and hoard it and sell it over price to the people. That's why they too, once they see that the thing is in, uh, premise is in, they start rushing to buy it and go and keep it for their uh, work. So this time around, we are appealing to them. They shouldn't use gallons to buy. They should buy what they can use for the day. Then following day or following two days, if they want to go back to fishing again, they go in for another thing. It's better than to go and hold it because today it is the father, the parent. Tomorrow it can be the children, but it can be their grandchildren. We are just appealing to them to be very careful. Yeah, lastly, has your outfit able to assess the cost of the fire? Um, as at now, the items too. The, as at now, uh, we learned uh, about four. Outboard, uh, five outboard motors got bent. Then uh, compass that lead them to the sea. Also, I think three of uh, three of them got bent. Then uh, uh, fishing net. That one is uncountable because the, uh, one person alone has almost about 250 pieces, so it is uncountable. But we are still working on it to make sure that we get the actual figure. But it is something that will be difficult to to get. Any appeal from your outfit to the general public? The only thing I'm appealing to all the uh, companies and individuals and churches, uh, it is hard time. So I believe that if little donation from uh, the individuals or uh, companies, uh, MTN, Vodafone and Co and churches, it will help a long way. Because if they say somebody has a, a second degree burning, we should understand that he, is going to, he or she is going to spend a lot of money to get out of the hospital. So this time around, we're only appealing to the public and the whole Ghana that everybody should come to their aid so that we see how best we can assist these our brothers in their difficult time. So Richard Kojonyaku joins us. Uh, Richard, we covered this incident last week, Thursday. Uh, tell us how those injured are faring now. <laughs> Hello, Belis. Hello, Richard. Can you hear me? 
Yes, I can hear you now. Great. I'm asking you to give us details uh, on those who were injured in that Cape Coast incident last week. Well, so those who are injured are doing well currently. Some are at the Cape Coast Teaching Hospital, and then the others that uh, sustained some severe injuries, they were transferred to the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. And so we are told by the officials that these people are doing very well. We are also even told that they numbered more than 12 or a dozen and so um, it's hard time for really the people that live at Abrofumpano. Uh, that is a suburb of Cape Coast near the Cape Coast Castle. And so these people are doing very well. Mm, uh, Richard, uh, we just had the Nadmo boss in the region raise concerns about hoarding of fuel. And it appears to be the similar situation in, in Second D, uh, resulting in that incident yesterday. What do you know about the situation uh, with regards to uh the the hoarding of premix fuel and how it's even distributed in cape coast well so it's the same thing it's a similar incident um, that has happened at, uh, in the western region and you remember that um some months ago uh, the same thing happened at elmina that led to the, the loss of lives about four fishermen lost their lives the same hoarding um of premix fuel has been the cause of all of these fires that i mean catch um or that that happened at the various landing beaches so um the ghana national fire service when they came there uh, to um paint the fire they told uh, the media that they have been then holding series of education for them that they should not be holding the mixed fuel in their rooms. But I mean, um, after two weeks of holding those uh, educational uh, seminars or education for them, uh, this incident happened. So it's, it's one of the causes of um, uh, the fires that have been happening at the various landing beaches. They go, they buy them because the premium of how the premium fuel is also distributed. They bring them to the outlets, and then when they bring them to the outlets, the people come and buy them in drums. And so they put these drums in their rooms. And so with the little heat or anything, then there is a spark of fire. Mm. Clearly, uh, th this raises concerns about safety of fishermen and persons who work in the fisheries industry. Uh, we've tried to, we've, we've reached out to the national chairman of the Premix Fuel Committee, Neil Ante Panaman. Uh, we are yet to receive a response. But Richard, is the local Premix Fuel Committee there saying anything about this incident? Well, so they are worried, they are concerned, and they said that they've been holding meetings after um, the incident happened and so they are going to come out they are lazy with their national outfit to come out with a different um operational strategy in order to distribute the premix fuel but as it starts now uh, it remains the same thing um the the outlets that caught fire has been put in place they were even lucky that the tanker that was on the ground in the ground that has been sunk in the ground where they put the premium fuel it didn't catch fire the ghana fire service um did their best to ensure that that tanker did not catch fire otherwise the, it would have been a huge disaster they were also even very happy that the the vehicle or the tanker that supply came to um supply the premix fuel um that, that came to supply the premix fuel uh, also even spread on before the fire even uh, um, i mean happened there so that is what they are saying for now there is no new strategy in the distribution of the premix fuel they are still stuck to the old ways of uh, distributing the premix fuel to these fishermen we'll leave it here that's richard kodonyako our cape coast correspondent giving us updates on that incident which occurred last week thursday and if you've been watching the program from the beginning uh you would have heard a similar incident occurred in second d just yesterday a week after that cape coast incident and richard was just telling us that uh, another occurred in elmina which led to the loss of four lives thankfully uh, with these two incidents in cape coast and second d no one has lost their lives we're praying it will remain so but this raises concerns about safety of fuel distribution at our beaches and what needs to be done about it. Definitely we'll try and get the chairman of the National Premix Committee to respond to some of the concerns raised and uh, do stay with us here on Joe News for that.
This is your election headquarters and residents of Cape Three Points in the Western Region say they will not take part in the December 7 election because of what they describe as years of deceit over the construction of the road leading to their town. The 32-kilometer stretch goes through more than 15 communities. Now, the town that has long been associated with Ghana's Jubilee oil fields, producing over 100,000 barrels of oil daily, has one of the worst roads in the region. Here's a report by my colleague, Justice Bader. Samson Quaison has been driving on the road to Cape Three Point since 2010. It was the same year Ghana started producing oil in commercial quantities, and even though Ghana's oil fields are offshore, Cape Three Point has been marked as the geographical reference point for the industry. Three years before that, when discovery was made, the people here went to town in joy, hoping that at least oil wealth would help reconstruct their road. As for this road, if it's not done, voting will be difficult. At the station where drivers load to Cape Three Point, many people say their work is slowly grinding to a halt. Sometimes you can spend three days on the road because of faults coming from the bad road. We spend a lot on maintenance. Even, even when our uh, women want to, the, the pregnant woman want to go to hospital, they have to carry them on their back. So if I is cheating. Last year, for almost the umpteenth time, government said it was going to construct the road. Contractors came onto the road and then abandoned it in months. We have been already cheated. Always when they come, so they will do the wood, so vote for us, they will do the big. So we have decided that this 2020 election, day, no road, no vote. Abandoned is it? As for the road, if it is not done, we do not even want to see ballot boxes here. As the country gets ready to vote in a few weeks, the people of Cape Three Point are seizing the moment to speak up about their biggest need. A good road. Justin Spadu, Joy News, Cape Three Point. And still on elections, there's increase in fear and skepticism among residents of Sandama and adjoining communities about the ability of the police to deal with crime amidst 347 electoral hotspots, as they also complain of armed robberies. As part of the Joy News series on security in hotspots ahead of the elections, Upper East Regional Correspondent Albert Sore visited Sandama to look at the situation there. The spate of armed robbery attacks here in Sandema have become a source of worry for many people in this town. We can't even work after seven because of the robbers. The little money you get, they will rob you. These days, the armed robbery case here is very serious. And we as business women, we suffer. We can't travel. And anytime we are traveling and coming to Sandema, and it's, it's around five, we have to sleep in Bolga or Navrongo before. The next day, then we come. Joseph Apawi, a mobile money vendor here in Sandema, is one of the victims of armed robbery. On the 14th of August this year, while on the way home from work, four men armed with a gun attacked him and took away his money, his motorcycle and other valuable items. I closed from work around 6.30 and I was on my way going home. I was almost getting to the house and there were four armed robbers with a gun. So I, they just stopped me on the way and pointed the gun on me and told me to lie down. I lay down and they collected my bag with the money, removed all my phones, took my uh, Honda motorbike and went away with it. Less than a month later, Teoflos Isaka, also a mobile money vendor here in Sandema, was attacked in a similar manner. 
on the 5th of last month, 5th of last month, October, 5th October. It was around 9 going, I closed from work and I was going to the house. Then two guys came with a tot light and a gun and a cutlass. They were fully masked and they were wearing overall jackets and then the trousers all were black. Then they asked me to lie down. <coughs> I lie down and then the one having the cutlass used it and hit on my head. Then it cuts me. Then the gunman told me I shouldn't worry. I should just give them the bag. Then I hand over the bag to them. They took all my phones on my pocket and then my wallet. And then they asked me to run. My bag, uh, there was a cash uh, sum of uh, 3,000 each and then 11 mobile phones inside the bag. However, one armed robbery incident that has left many residents here in Sandema in shock was a broad daylight attack on the Church of Pentecost only two Sundays ago. I think we had closed from service and so uh, most of the congregants had gone. But uh, the, the one who counts the church's money was seated uh, at this corner of the church. So I also came and then whilst we were talking on the issue she wanted to discuss with me, two young men uh, came into the church whilst we were talking. The top apparel they were wearing was quite, it was black. So initially we thought that there were police officers who had come to make some inquiries about the the protocols of the coronavirus. So the other one, uh, who had a gun with him, uh, cocked the gun, and then he asked us to lie flat on the floor. Then they took the money that were on the table uh, with a bowl. There was also a bowl that the offerings uh, were inside. So uh, they took the money, they took everything, and then they came and searched us, uh, took our mobile phones and our personal, our personal monies and then they bolted off. When they came out of the church, then they gave warning shots. Then they shot in the air, I think twice, before they sped off. And we heard several gunshots as they went. Not a single arrest has yet been made by the Sandema police, leaving the victims of these armed robbery attacks and even the general public wondering if the police here are up to the task of keeping the peace especially as we draw closer to the elections. Uh, what I'm thinking the government should do is they should beef up the security situation in Sandema. It's like the police or the security people are reluctant. And any time you report a case, they don't take it serious. It will take some time before. Even my, my case like this, when I reported to them, it took them two hours. And for, by then, the, the, the armed robbers, they will they, find their way. According to the Ghana Police Service, in its recent regional flashpoint matrix, the Upper East Region has a total of 345 flashpoints. The Bulsa North District, where Sandema is the capital, has 23 of these flashpoints, the sixth highest in the region. There have been pockets of other recent armed robbery attacks in some parts of the Upper East Region, including Tili on the Bolgatanga Boku Road, Karmenga on the Bolgatanga Tamale Road, and within the Bolgatanga Township itself, where at least two armed robberies have taken place in this month of November. Many citizens of the Upper East Region are therefore worried that insecurity may just be on the rise as the country nears another general election on December 7. Albert Sorry, Joy News, Sandema. Now, the chief imam, Osman Nuhu uh, Sharabutu, has also been speaking about the elections. And the General Secretary of the Christian Council, Dr. Sarah Faya, said, well, they've all been admonishing Ghanaians to guard the peace we have as we head to pol the polls in some 17 days at an event that religious leaders action and support for peaceful elections organized by the light foundation they indicated the peace ghana enjoys cannot be sacrificed for political gain here's a report by mamiesi thompson
For a high-stakes election, religious leaders were sure to project the importance of preserving the peace Ghana is enjoying. Both the Christian and Islamic sides agree that in order to do so, they have to educate and sensitize followers, especially the youth, to desist from fomenting trouble. Special guest of honor, Chief Imam Osman Nuhu Sharbutu, cautioned not to sacrifice the nation's peace for political gain. We are living as Muslims together with the practitioners of other faiths. We are living in peace and harmony. It is possible for us to sit around the same table at a time when nations surrounded us within the subregion are plunged in wars and confusion and political instability. This grace God has done to Ghana must be General Secretary of the Christian Council, Reverend Dr. Cyril Fayosi, underscored how crucial it was for the two sides to unite for the sake of peace. According to him, it serves as a shining example for the rest of the world. Ethnicity, religion, race and other things are used to foment trouble. And if we can at least uh, have a handle on peace within the religious front, that is a major achievement. So I believe that that can infect and affect the way we do things in the country. I think uh, uh, violence doesn't solve any problem. Uh, democracy is about taking decisions and governing ourselves. So I call on all Ghanaians to go out there and exercise their franchise, go and vote. But in doing so, they should do it in peace. Security analyst Adam Bonner indicates such collaborations are helpful in killing perceptions of violence in the lead up to the election. Usually come together like this to you know forge peace because at the end of the day uh, when there is chaos one of the few places individuals run to are either the churches or the mosques because under a certain UN convention or protocol churches mosques or religious hospitals and the like are not supposed to be destroyed during war so when there is no peace, those who suffer the most, apart from the children, the vulnerable and the rest, are religious uh, leaders. And so in... The Light Foundation is also training community leaders to carry on sensitization in their communities. You're still watching News Desk with me, Bernice Abubedulan. And President Ekufado has directed the Inspector General of Police to immediately provide 24 hour police protection for Martin Amidu, who resigned earlier this week as Special Prosecutor on claims of interference by the President. In an interview made available to the media by Mr. Amidu himself, he explained that intelligence available to him indicates plans of killing him robbing him and arson, among others. There's more in the following report. All these threats about burgling me, I'm robbery, burning my house. I'm aware. I tried to call Kandapa, he didn't pick it. And I know the person's involved, I can name them. The former special prosecutor Martin Amidu says he has tried to reach out to the National Security Minister Kandapa and successfully to inform him about the threats on his life. He has instead reached out to President Ekofado. The president will be responsible for anything that happens to me. I live my life on the Republic of Ghana and the president has a constitutional duty to protect me. I don't need any security at my house or to follow me. And anybody who makes an attempt, he will have himself to blame. In that interview, he also denies a sin central MP Kennedy Japon's claims that he sought medical attention in Germany due to his mental instability. I have never been to Germany on any occasion. Let I mean for a medical checkup. I don't know any German hospital or any German clinic, and therefore his allegations are false. 
He followed this interview with a statement to further clarify his stance on the matter and also explains that in the course of duty as special prosecutor, he was painfully compelled to investigate Boko Central MP Mahama Yariga, a man he now describes as a son. Mr. Amidu has also been cautioning that the so-called responses and attacks will only push him to spew unpalatable truths. But I do not want anybody to blame me when I speak out and it becomes unpalatable. Either the attack stops or I will defend my integrity even if that means my death. First topic before we watch death violence in public. Well, the president has since directed the IGP to provide police protection for Mr. Amidu, Director of Communications at the President's Eugene Ahin, posted this on Facebook. And I quote, the attention of the office of the president has been drawn to claims by Mr. Martin Amidu, the former special prosecutor, of threats made against his life since his resignation from office. The president has thus directed the Inspector General of Police to provide Mr. Amidu immediately with 24-hour police protection. The former special prosecutor is also encouraged to assist the police with details of persons who've made these threats against his life so they can be dealt with in accordance with the laws of the country. And still to come here on News Desk, automobile firm Nissan announces it will commence local assembling of its vehicles from the third quarter of next year. Dao Pao has details in a moment. Hi, good morning. Welcome to business. My name is Daryl Kwao. Automobile firm Nissan has announced it will commence local assembling of its vehicles from the third quarter of next year. It's formally settled on Japan Motors as its local partner. Managing Director Salem Kaumoni has been speaking to Joy Business about the deal. We're excited that we have got it. It wasn't expected. It wasn't automatic. Uh, two other companies wanted uh, to have the, 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 Nis the appointment as assembler in Ghana and Japan Motors was uh, the third. And uh, there was due diligence, they came, they visited us, they, we had, they looked at our financials, they looked at our history, and as you know, Japan Motors had a long history. And after that, Nissan decided that no, the uh, appointment will be to Japan Motors, yes. So what are you going to bring onto the table? I mean, we know you as a, a distributing outlet, yes. now you're moving into assembling. Do you have the expertise to do yes. this? Oh, that's a good question. And if you were there yesterday, okay, we've done it before. We were assembling vehicles, uh, Nissan vehicles, from 1968 all the way to, I think, 7980 when we stopped. So we were assembling vehicles. We have the, uh, uh, yes, we know what it takes. Um, and what we're bringing in is the, the facilities, a great location, which is in Tema, you need to be very close to the, to the port because you're getting uh, uh, containers. Um, and number two, you, it's it's good that when you assemble, you also have uh, you're you're very good. You have the distribution network, uh, the branches uh, in 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 the country. So this is what we're bringing in. that all other things being equal, yeah. what period are you hoping to start the process in assembling, yeah. and yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, this depends on Nissan, uh, a collaboration with them. Uh, we have uh, started, let's say, uh, our plan is to start the process. Right now we've started with civil works. We've identified the place and started the civil works. Uh, by the time we finish with the civil works, procure the equipment, you know, the uh, uh, assembly equipment and testing equipment, well, in other news this morning, payment of government bailout funds for customers of the defunct fund management firms is expected to commence next week. This is, however, subject to customers meeting some critical conditions that are expected to facilitate the payment. Here's uh, Director General of the Securities and Action Commission, Reverend Daniel Ogbamitete. Again, to make it clear, we say it's a partial bailout. Partial bailout because there's a clear bailout package 
that has been agreed upon, which was rolled out uh, at the end of September when we had the uh, 22, uh, 22 firms that were um, under official liquidation, the official liquidator had met them. So there's a, a bailout package, mm -hmm. but because the liquidation order or orders are yet to be um, you know, granted for a number of these outstanding ones, we say, okay, this is a partial or an interim relief that is being provided. So the, the plan is that as and when the liquidation orders are granted, then the full bailout package will be triggered. Mm. You know, mm. the full bailout package has X amount in tier one and then Y amount in tier two based on the category mm. in which you find yourself below 60, more than 60 and so on and so forth. So once the liquidation orders are granted, then the affected claimants will fall into the uh, bailout package as currently designed. So, so that really is, is, is doesn't mean that there could be a situation where a judge of my heart about a hundred thousand Ghana cities outside this whole process, but it's just going to get fifty thousand first, and then later when everything is clear, it will fall in line with the tier one, the tier two as well. Absolutely, that, that's all I'm saying. So, if George Uyafi, um has hundred thousand, it means that for this partial bailout. George Riafi is getting um, 50,000. Now, after the liquidation order, if George Riafi is less than um, 60 years, and looking at you, I think you are less than 60 years. <laughs> if George Riafi is less than 60 years, then George Riafi will have an additional 20,000 in uh, tier one and the remaining 30,000 will be in tier two because that is the current uh, design of the bailout. If you are below 60, you get up to 70,000 in tier one and then the remainder in tier two. So, so that is the plan. And that's your business update. The news continues after this break.